morning and welcome to worship here at Osable Grove Presbyterian Church. We are so glad that you are able to join us this morning. I usually start out the worship with announcements and I don't have many things to say this morning except that Wednesday is Earth Day and I'd love to see what you're doing to help out our Earth. Send in pictures of videos if you're planting, if you're gardening, if you're sprucing up your lawns, whatever it is. And even in Bible study, we talked about how everyone could get out there and pick up some garbage during this time. So next week, we'll be celebrating our Earth on Earth Sunday. The farm report this week relates to COVID-19. It is bad. There is no doubt about it. I chose to look back in history to see if we had another that killed a lot of people. A lady, Joan Hardikoff in Sandwich, Illinois, got to looking in some old newspapers and found that in 1918 and 1919, the flu hit the Midwest pretty hard. A telegraph survey survey said that in Illinois state, there were over 50,000 cases of the Spanish flu with some deaths. For a three-month period, schools were closed. No church services were allowed and no lodge meeting of any kind were permitted. Thankfully, we have modern technology like Zoom and computers to help us stay in touch. Please join me in our call to worship. Our hearts are glad and our soul rejoices. Our bodies dwell secure. You show us a path of life in your presence. There is a fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Alleluia. Praise the Lord. Our opening hymn today will be, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. By God's great mercy, we are given a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Let us turn away from sin and walk in the joy of new life in Christ. Please join me in our prayer of confession. Just and faithful God, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We know your love alone lights up the night, and yet we are caught in the glare of distractions. We fail to listen to those who saw Jesus and believed. We do not live together in unity and love for one another. Forgive and cleanse us. 
Keep your word in us for the sake of Jesus. Amen. Hear this, that Jesus loved and freed us by his blood. Let us therefore walk in the light as Jesus is in the light and have the fellowship with one another. May the peace of the Lord be with you always and also with you. Hello, for today, for the children's sermon, we have a little segment I like to call Ask the Pastor. And last weekend, during Good Friday and Holy Saturday and Easter, Cecilia, Dean, and Joel were thinking, how can that be three days? Three days from Friday, Saturday, to Sunday. That seems more like two days, they were thinking. So they sent me an email, and this is what I sent them said, great question. The way to understand it is that in biblical early Jewish counting, it was different than ours. You see, they would count a day as starting the evening before. So day one started Thursday at dusk to Friday. That's the day Jesus is crucified, day one. Then Friday evening to Saturday evening is day two. And then Saturday evening to Sunday, when Jesus rises again, is day three. So that's how they would count three days. And think of it, they don't have a fancy Apple Watch like I do, so they would rely purely on nature. The sun setting, the sun rising, so their days may look very different from ours. Thank you for your great question, Joel, Cecilia, and Dean, and I hope I answered it as well as I could, and I can't wait till we can talk about it in person. The prayer for illumination, let us pray. We do not ask, holy Jesus, to touch or see your wounds, but that you come to us in our fear and let us hear the words of those who saw you and believed. You bless those who have not seen but yet believed. Bless us now and take away our doubt. Amen. Our first reading this morning is Psalm 16. Listen for God's word. Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, You are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the holy ones in the land, they are the noble, in whom is all my delight. Those who choose another god multiply their sorrows. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names upon my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The boundary lines have failed for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I keep the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body also rests secure. For you do not give me up to Sheol, or let your faithful ones see the pit. You show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The reading is 1 Peter chapter 1, 3 through 9. A living hope. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the, gu the guidance of your faith, being more precious than gold, that through perishable is tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor with Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him, and even though you did not see him now, you believe in him 
and rejoice with an indescribable, glorious joy, for you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. It is so good to be coming to you from the pulpit this week so that you can see our beloved church as we worship today. This past month, I've tried to intentionally connect with others, checking in, asking how you are doing, if there is anything you need, listening to stories. And I am very grateful, as I've said before, for the many different ways that we have to connect. Some people love Zoom while others hide from Zoom and I've yet to see their faces. Some prefer to write an email or to send a quick text. I've enjoyed phone call conversations and I've enjoyed seeing updates on social media. All are okay. Whichever you prefer, it is all right. And again, I say I am thankful for the ways that we have to connect with one another during this time. And I am so thankful for those who haven't really met me yet or have gotten to know me yet, but have still reached out as your pastor, reached out to me to get to know me and to let me hear your stories, which I cherish so very much. And I've noticed that in this time, in this time of connecting in various ways, whichever way we use, there's one thing that is always common, that is always present, is our sense of hope. Our sense of hope for the future, and our sense of hope for our time when we come to back together as a congregation, and our sense of hope of our future plans, that are all given a great foundation by our faith. There is much hope in our future together. In the time that First Peter was written, there wasn't all these different ways to communicate. They either had letter or face-to-face -face conversations. And this letter in First Peter was sent to a congregation that had great faith but we're going through difficult, difficult time. This letter believed to be written by Peter was intended to give the early Christians hope in the face of that persecution. And in the Roman Empire, things had gotten terrible for Christians. They didn't share their society's values or worship the society's gods. And they didn't worship the emperor as they were commanded to do. The mad Emperor Nero, one who was known for being ruthless, for being crazy, wanted to rebuild Rome. So how did he do that? He burned everything. And in the year 64 of the Common Area, he blamed the Christians for everything that was going wrong. And under Nero, persecution and torture of the Christians was raised to a new level. This level of persecution is the context in which Peter wrote this letter. However, notice that he did not start it with talking about all the terrible things that his readers had been experiencing and hearing about. No, no, Peter starts it with a focus of praising God for the wonderful things that God was doing and reminding them of the hope that they have in the future even in the face of death. Peter's approach in facing trials was that no matter how difficult the trial we face, nothing compares to the greatness of what God has done and what God did for us through Jesus Christ. Therefore, we can praise God no matter where we are at in our lives. Peter maintains that genuine faith generates genuine praise. This reading continues the Easter proclamation by great mercy. God has given a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 
The first word is praise. Because God acts towards us in mercy, and thus we are able to act in joy, in praise, in hope, and in faith. In our reading from 1 Peter, he focuses on three things. Faith, suffering, and salvation. First is faith. While Christians with roots in the Protestant Reformation have long proclaimed faith alone as the way we are saved, there has been great debate over what faith means. In the 16th century, Calvin and early Reformed confessions emphasized that faith, faith consists of both knowledge and a deep trust in God's benevolence. Peter's reference in 1 Peter 1.8 to the people believing in Jesus without having seen him was likely a direct reference to what we read last week in John 20.29b. 20, it reads this, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Peter was encouraging his readers and seeking to build their faith, commending them for their faith, and commending them for the joy that they had in Jesus. The goal of that faith, the hope that kept them going, that keeps us all going, was the salvation that we receive by God's grace through faith alone in Jesus. So I ask you this now, what does it mean when you say, I believe? Do your words become rote, something that you just say day to day? Or do they embody, do your words, I believe, embody everything that you are? So during this time, I challenge you to take those two words, I believe, and write sentences to what it is that you believe. And then I challenge you to read them out loud. Let them fill the room. Let the words surround you so that those words, I believe, dot, 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 become your song during this time. And if it takes some time for it to become something that lifts you up, then that's okay too. Repeat as often as necessary. So second, Peter touches on suffering. Their suffering, our suffering, from faith goes to suffering. And Peter explained why, explains why these Christians suffer the contempt of those around them. It is so that the genuineness of your faith may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. See, Peter was telling them that their faithfulness to Christ under these difficult circumstances, that itself preaches the gospel. When it is confirmed, the whole world will see it and give praise and joy to God. First century Jews and pagans alike reflected on human suffering as this, that it was an educational value it wasn't suffering because we had done something wrong or as punishment, but they turned it around and used it as an opportunity to learn. We can be reminded that we are made to be hopeful people. If only we could eliminate all the hurts in the world, all the pain, all the grief, all the disappointment, but no one, no one has ever promised that there won't be heartache. But as Christians, we seek to live a genuine faith and then discover that hope is sown in tears. Peter is encouraging us to endure suffering with an inner attitude of freedom and with faith. That we have been given strength, and this has helped many in hard times throughout history. What do we need to take away from this time? I encourage you again to write down what is it that I need to take away from this time? What have we learned? I know I have learned the value of togetherness, 
realizing the importance of what we had when it was lost. And as I preach here to empty pews, I'm imagining all of your faces sitting among each other in those pews, and that is great hope and understanding for our future together. And finally, in this section from 1 Peter, he talks about salvation. He affirms that his ultimate goal is salvation. Our ultimate goal is salvation. You are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Some have understood salvation as a future reward given to those who remain faithful throughout their entire lives. Others have interpreted, interpreted salvation as a quality of present life, wholeness of being here and now. <clears throat> Paul Tillich suggests a balance. Salvation is derived from salvus, healthy or whole, and it can be applied to every act of healing. In this passage, salvation has both future and present dimensions. The blessing assures that the suffering is temporary and will be ending. Jesus left us an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. One of the best sentences in the scripture is found in verse 8 of the text today. Although you have not seen him, you love him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. Believe in him? Sure. Rejoice with an indescribable joy? Not always. Maybe not during this time. But I know we are trying. We are trying to rejoice. And the rejoicing is in the hope and in our faith that there is better things yet to come. Jesus knows exactly where we are. And we cannot hide from the risen Christ. He does not condemn our struggles to believe in God's power and God's goodness. When all we'd imagined and planned gets upended like it has right now, he makes his way to us even in those times. Wherever we are, to reassure us to the trustworthiness of God's creative and living word. He allows us to see him, to touch him, to stare at and to study him, to recognize our own fragility and our own shock. Then he reminds us all of what he taught us. He gives us the gifts he promised that he would. And with hope and with faith, we accept. Amen. And as a sign of our faith, let us all sing together the doxology. Please join me in our affirmation of faith from the Heidelberg Catechism. What is true faith? True faith is not only a sure knowledge by which I hold as true all that God has revealed to us in Scripture. It is also a wholehearted trust, which the Holy Spirit creates in me by the gospel, that God has freely granted not only to others but to me also forgiveness of sins, eternal righteousness, and salvation. These are gifts of sheer grace granted solely by Christ's merit.
For joys and concerns today, our prayers continue to be with Patty Doyle as she continues to receive care. And with Rachel, Betty, and Jerry's daughter-in-law, who will be having surgery this Tuesday, our prayers are with you. And a joy is Mar and Louie are celebrating 69 years of marriage. We are very grateful for their presence in our church community and that the love that they have shared for over 69 years. Let us pray. Lord, protect us. Bring us by the Holy Spirit into fellowship with your Son. Keep us for the inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, the eternal life made ours by Jesus' resurrection. God of redemption and resurrection, we come to you as we are, rejoicing that our Lord is alive, yet still afraid of the chaos around and within us. We cannot help but doubt your goodness when so much suffering surrounds us. The pandemic continues to cause sickness and take life. Resources are scarce in the places that are needed the most. People all over the world are desperate for life's basic necessities. Our Easter alleluias get stuck in our throats when we survey the pain of your glorious creation. Come, risen Lord, walk among us. Show us your wounds. Give us your peace. Breathe the Spirit into our weariness and our worries. God of pursuing grace and mercy, we come to you as we are, grateful of your gift of reconciliation. Yet we are still unsure if we have the courage to go and extend your forgiveness to others. We are prone to hold grudges and too often find satisfaction in the downfall of our enemies. Our Easter hallelujahs sometimes feel hypocritical when we look around at all the sin in which we participate. Come, risen Lord, walk among us. Show us that you are alive. Grant us the peace that passes all understanding. Embolden us with the Spirit so that we might speak your word and do your will. God of loving kindness and relentless reconciliation, we come to you as we are, praising you for your unwillingness to leave us alone. Yet tired in the face of the world's overwhelming needs, we believe that Jesus is our Lord. We know he commands us to follow his example of servant leadership. We remember all he has taught us about the least and the last, asking and receiving, moving mountains with mustard seed faith, knowing that you come to us just as we are, keeping your promises and never abandoning us. We are able to shout our Easter hallelujahs, echoing the heavenly chorus that spurs us on to run the race set before us. You are here, risen Lord, wounded and standing before us. Your sure presence gives us hope. Your spirit, our advocate, comforter, and teacher will show us the way and accomplish your plans. We worship you, our Lord and our God, and we pray in your name as you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Although we are not here to physically pass the plate to one another, we are still called to give our offering. Our Lord sends us to do God's work of reconciliation, bringing the good news of salvation to the ends of the earth. The giving of God tithes and our offerings furthers the work of the church, which Christ entrusts us to do. Let us worship God with our morning's offering. Let us pray. Give us courage, O God, to lay at your feet our possessions, mindful that there are those among us who are needy. Show us how to live with less and love you more. Strengthen in us the faith that 
that is more precious than gold. And we sing our thanksgiving to you in joy forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn today is Alleluia. good and pleasant it is when we live in community together in unity. Let us now go in a communion of the spirit of the one God of our ancestors. Let us go into this world and bring peace to all. Amen.